we are in the top of the hour and we need to get started to our, to our next talk. Um, and our next talk is gonna be given by Wenbin Liu from Stony Brook University. His talk is iFunk, uh, UCX programming interface for remote function injection and invocation. And we and I see that we've been already share his presentation. Yeah, and we're can able I see to my see screen? It. Yes, and we can okay. see the screen. Yes, and we can hear you as well. Okay, so let me so, just get started. Yes, and, and feel free to introduce yourself. Uh, oh, okay, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Mamilu, and I am a PhD student at the Stony Brook University. So today I'll be talking about iFunk remote function injection and the invocation interface for UCX. And uh, this was my internship um, project at ARM Research in the past summer. So let's talk about motivations first. Um, we live in the age of information explosion. As people are uploading more and more photos and videos, they're streaming more movies and games, and uh, the demand like this just keeps goes up. But all these data must be handled by data centers and they consume a non-trivial amount of energy. Now, if we look at this forecast published on Nature, by the year of 2030, 21% of global electricity consumption will be spent on information and the communication technology, in which 7% of these will be consumed by data centers. So, as we can see, this has financial and environmental consequences, and we would like to make um, it more efficient. Um, inside these data centers, we are running these sophisticated applications. Their workflow tends to be very dynamic and regular. We have user interactions that is hard to predict, and we have data-dependent algorithms that changes execution paths depend on the real-time data it is see. So what's making it worse is that this workflow spans different um, data centers and different machines in the same data center. As the data is gathered and stored at different locations, this makes data locality a big issue. And uh, moving this data around is very costly. If we look at these latency numbers, a round trip in the same data center is 500 times slower than main memory reference. And that means a lot of waste cycles. And this is all because we have a processor-centric view where we always try to move data to compute the resources, no matter how far they are. But what if we take the other way around? What if we try to move compute data instead? In traditional storage um, systems, the processing unit first issues a request of data from the storage array. The storage array returns the data to the compute um, processors. It does the computation and then op optionally write the result back to the storage system. But now we have these computational storage devices or called CSDs. They have their own processing units that are built in or very, very close to the storage units. And uh, so in some cases, we can simply send a request from the processing unit to the storage array and they will use their internal processors to do the computation and then return the result to the requester. In some cases, like if we, all we need is to generate a thumbnail of a picture to do a checksum or any kind of reduction operations, then this can avoid unnecessary data movements, uh, improve data locality, and potentially use hardware accelerated features if the CSD supports them. Now, uh, we also have more versatile data processing units and or smart NICs. For example, the NVIDIA Mellanox Bluefield DPUs has an ARM PC integrated on the NIC. It has its own memory, its own storage, running its own operating system, and it has hardware accelerated features like direct access to non-volatile memory, crypto algorithms, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, these smart NICs and uh, DPUs are going to appear in data centers, and we must be able to take advantage of these smart NICs. So indeed, how exactly are we going to do it? I mean, we have this hardware, but how does the software actually moves computer around? 
right? In these machines, we may even have different uh, um, instruction set architectures. We have different network um, architectures. We have different types of workloads. So the perfect model to do this should be portable and should be scalable and should be relatively easy to maintain. Of course, data, uh, sorry, sorry, Docker containers are portable, but shipping them around is not exactly scalable. And uh, also we would like to integrate the new programming model with existing development cycles and be able to adapt to rapidly changing requirements. For example, if we have to use a new domain specific language or a very heavyweight framework, then it is going to be quite inconvenient when you uh, add new functions or you're trying to interact with existing libraries. So in this project, we have decided to take a low level approach. We will design an API for moving compute to data in the form of remotely injected functions. That's about as low level as we can get. And uh, we want to provide an optimized implementation for the set API on top of UCX. And the name of the API is going to be IFUNC, which stands for injected functions. So a brief outline for the rest of the talk. First, I will give a bit of background information on the project. And then we we'll go straight to the API design of the IFUNC. Uh, system and uh, the implementation of the IFUNC API on top of UCX. Then we will show some performance evaluation results and then we talk about conclusion and some future work. So this work is part of the two chains framework, which is designed to package, transfer and execute code and data in distributed environments. And the two chains frameworks aims to be fast, lightweight, and portable. It will has, have its own API and tool chain, but it will be based on UCX to support CPUs, CSDs, DPUs, and GPUs. If you're interested in learning more about the two chains framework, you can check um, the two chains paper published in cluster 2021, which gives more detail about the, the scope of the, this two chains project. So here's a diagram of UCX and the IFUNC API will be part of UCP. So it enjoys the portability provided by the lower layers of UCX. The users of IFUNC API doesn't have to worry about communication protocols. It is very much a um, application facing API. So uh, since this is a UCX workshop, I assume everyone already knows about the basics of UCX. Like you have to first create the UCP context, you create workers, you connect them through UCP endpoints, and then you perform communications. I just need to emphasize that in this work, we choose to deliver iPhone messages using our DMA. So in a UCX application, once the user has mapped a pinned memory region using UCP map map and have obtained the remote access key R key, we're ready to write the pin memory regions of other endpoints. So implementing a put-based iPhone API is easier and allows us to focus on more interesting parts of the work. So here's the basic idea of um, iPhone. The idea is that we can ship a compiled C function to the target process along with a set of arguments or called payloads. Once the iPhone message is delivered, the UCX runtime will invoke the main iPhone function with the payload as one of its arguments. Here is the signature of the main function. The first two arguments points to the payload and the size of the payload, and the payload was shipped from the source process to the target process. The third argument points to a user-defined location on the target process. This can be used um, for the iPhone library to access data structures or function pointers or whatever the program defines to be on the target process. And uh, the iPhones are identified using their names. So for different iPhone libraries, you should um, replace this foo here with the name of your iPhone library. Now you may ask, um, don't we already have active messages in UCX? Uh, what's the difference between active messages and the iPhone? And yes, there are many, many similarities. Uh, for example, both UCX ActiveMessage and iPhone allows user-defined handlers 
that will be invoked once the message is delivered. They both allow transfer of payloads from the source process to the target process. And both of them require the active polling on the target process so that the incoming messages can be handled. But the similarities end there, and we are uh, going to talk about the differences, which are more important. The first one is that for UCX active messages, the handlers are registered on the target process. Once you uh, completed the registration, the UCX runtime will return a numeric ID that can be used by the source process to tell the target process which handler to invoke. So it is essentially a function point. Right. The UCX active messages are identified using numeric IDs. But for iPhones, it's, come, it's the other way around. The iPhone libraries are loaded on the source process. The target process doesn't need to know about it at all. Once loaded, they are identified using C strings, and uh, the code will be sent along with the message to the target process. So this is a very important difference because for active message, the handler functions are fixed and must be visible to the compiler when you compile your application. If you need to change anything, you need to compile it again. But for iFunk, the target process doesn't even need to restart. It might as well be running like a daemon, and we just send and execute newly written iFunk functions without changing anything else. Um, the last difference is that our implementation uh, depends on RDMA enabled buffers allocated by the user, which is not as easy to use as the internal message buffers of UCP active message. So in the future, we do plan to switch to send and receive semantics and use UCX internal message buffers. Now, to create an iPhone library, first you need to pick a name, as iPhones are identified and referred to using strings. Suppose your iPhone is called foo, then you need to at least define the following three functions in your iPhone library. First one, the full payload bound function takes a set of source arguments on the source process and then returns the maximum size of the payload that will be sent to the target process. The UCX runtime will call this function for you and allocate a payload buffer that is large enough. If you have used compression libraries like Zlib, then you, will, you should have seen something very similar. They provide a function to estimate the size of the compression result so that you can allocate a buffer that is large enough. And then we have the full payload init function that takes the same set of arguments like the previous function, and then actually populates the payload buffer here allocated by UCX. The size of the payload is passed in as a pointer so that if the payload is actually smaller than the previous estimation, we can notify the UCX runtime and the UCX runtime will shrink the size of the message to avoid sending unnecessarily large messages. And again, this is very similar to Zlib. And uh, at the last, we have this main function I've showed you before. And uh, this is the entry point to the iPhone library on the target process. Once the iPhone message is delivered, the UCX runtime will first call this function to enter the um, execution of actually useful work. Of course, you don't have to cram all your code into the main function. You can create other functions as long as they are compiled into the same um, library. Now, once you're done with the source code, we provide a compilation toolchain to compile the iPhone source code into a single SO file. And uh, you put this file into a location accessible by the source process, identified by the UCX iPhone lib there, there, um, environment variable, and the UCX will pick it up and you're good to go. Though so this toolchain does depend on the ISA and the ISA of the source and target processor. So it's kind of a little bit restrictive and we'll talk about it in a bit. And hopefully this diagram will make it uh, easier to understand. So first, the iPhone library must be registered by the UCX runtime. It is tied to um, the UCP context. Then every time we create an iPhone message, the runtime will first call payload bound to get the size of the payload 
And so the usage runtime can allocate a message frame that is large enough, right, with an appropriate size. And then the UCX runtime will call um, payload init so that the user code in the iPhone library can populate this payload buffer with whatever should be delivered to the target process. Once this is done, the text and the data sections will be copied from the iPhone library into the message and the header will be constructed. And uh, now the message is ready and the user can send it to the target process using an RDMA write. A polling function call on the target process will check the buffer and recognize that I found message in it, and it will execute its main function. So now let's look at the UCP level I found APIs. These four are the four most important routines for sending an I found message. So on the source process, we need at least the three of them to do it. The first one is that it is um, we need to register the iFunk library first. So we have UCP register iFunk. It registers an iPhone specified by the name here, and it returns an iPhone handle, which can be used to create the iPhone messages of this type. This pure parameter, if it is true, then it stands, it tells the UCX runtime that the iPhone library does not use any external symbols like global variables and functions on the target process. It is entirely self-contained. And uh, by saying this is true, the UCX runtime will be able to skip a few expensive operations on the target process, and this can improve the performance. Then once registration is done, we need this iFunk message create function to create iFunk messages. It takes a handler to the iFunk. It takes a set of source arguments, the size of source arguments, which um, will be passed to these functions. It's the same set of source arguments to create the payload and uh, in turn creates the entire message. So um, now an iPhone message has been created. We can write it to the destination buffer using UCP iPhone send NDX, which look, actually looks very similar to UCP put if you have seen that before. It takes an endpoint which identifies the target. Um, it takes a handler to the iPhone message, a memory address, to write a message to and an RDMA remote key, which is returned to you by the UCX runtime when you allocate the RDMA enabled memory. Now, for the targeted process, all it needs to do is to call this UCP pull iPhone function to check whether there is a valid iPhone message in the buffer. If it doesn't see anything, it will return immediately. Otherwise, it will execute the entry function of the iPhone. The targeted process does not need to do any kind of registration, etc. It just checks a buffer for incoming messages because the code is already shipped within the message. So let's recap a bit. The typical iPhone workflow is like this. On the targeted process, it needs to allocate an RDMA enabled pin memory so that it can receive iPhone message. Of course, the source process will need to know about the virtual address the, of the starting point of the buffer and the size of the buffer. The user will have to somehow communicate between the source process and the target process. And then all the target process need to do is simply pull the buffer for incoming messages. On the source process, once we have registered an iPhone using its name, we can create messages of this type by passing source arguments to UCX. And the runtime, the UCX runtime will prepare the payload by calling the payload bound and the payload init function implemented by the user inside the iPhone library. And after that, the message is ready and can be written to the target processes buffer. Now let's look at an example here. Um, suppose you have a database that collects data gathered by remote sensors. These sensors uses, um, use UCX to communicate with the server and uh, uploads the collected data. But what if you have a new, very efficient compression algorithm that can reduce the message size or improve the, uh, message the, the, the signal quality for the same message size? 
but your database is old and it doesn't support this new algorithm. And you can't even restart the database to perform an upgrade. Now you can embed the decompression algorithm in your message with iPhone. So here's an example of how you do this. The first part of the code is uh, show you how to write the iPhone library for this purpose. In the full payload bound function, you return the maximum size of the compressed data by this uh, estimation function. And then you, uh, the UCX runtime will call full payload init function with the same set of input arguments. And then you can have your encode function that compresses the data and then write it to the payload buffer. Now the message is created and it will be able to deliver to the database, uh, to, to the process that is running the database. And on the target process, this full main function will be invoked with a pointer to the delivered compressed payload and a handle of the database passed in as um, the void pointer target arguments. And here, as you can see, we can cast the target arguments to a handler to the database. And then we do the decompression with the code shift with the iPhone message to decompress the payload and then insert it into the database. So even if your database is old, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't support the new algorithm, it is fine because the decompression algorithm is already shifted along with the message. And uh, this is how you would write an application like this. Um, first, on the source process, we register the iFunk. We create an iFunk message with the recorded data from the sensor. And then we write a message to the destination buffer using uh, UCP iPhone send MPIS. And because this, this internally, this just is use UCP uh, put, then you need to flush the endpoint to ensure the delivery of the message. And um, this is everything you need on the sensor. Now, on the target process that is running the database, we use the iPhone poll function to check the buffer for arriving iPhone messages. Note that the address of a handle to the database is passed to the polling function, which will be related to the iPhone main function here by the UCX runtime. So now let's talk about the implementation of iPhone. When we call the registration routine, the UCX runtime searches the iPhone dynamic library using its name um, in the folder specified by the environment variable and opens the dynamic library using DR open. This is a one time registration cost. The result will be cached. And so it doesn't create any overhead for creating and sending um, subsequent iPhone messages. The UCX runtime in every message will ship the text data and read only data section so that uh, all internal function, all functions that are internal to the iPhone library, all global and function static variables, they are all shipped with the iPhone message so everything works. But what if the iPhone uses external symbols on the target process? So for example, you may want to call printf inside the, the main function. Maybe you need to do memory allocation, both of which using GBC. Maybe you need to get time or generate random numbers, et cetera. And, or you need to access global variables or function static variables on the target process. Now, this is a problem because in most modern Linux systems, they have address space layout randomization or called ASR enable. So, you know, when you execute your code, the memory map region for shared libraries, including your C library and uh, the executable themselves are random in the, uh, they have random locations in the virtual memory space. So you can't predict the virtual address of the symbols that you need. And in fact, what we're trying to solve here is that we're trying to resolve symbols like functions and variables at the runtime. So this is a problem of dynamic linking. And um, dynamic linking is defined as resolving the virtual address of symbols at program load time, or deferred even later, like than the first time you call the function. Normally, it is the operating system's C library's job, and you, the programmer don't, doesn't need to worry about it. It is done automatically 
by LD.SO. Now, the text section of our binaries, they usually only contain PC relative offsets to functions and variables. So that when you have address space layout randomization, you have unpredictable, unpredictable relative offsets, and you need some kind of mechanism to replace or to, to actually identify the true address of functions and variables. And uh, as the fundamental theorem of software engineering said, all problems in computer science can be solved by another level of interaction. And um, this is again solved by adding two levels of interaction, the procedure linkage table and the global offset table. So here's a diagram showing how dynamic linking works by default. Um, in your code, for every external function call like printf or malloc, it has one dedicated slot in the PLT and one dedicated slot in the GOT. The first time you call printf, it doesn't go straight to libc. Instead, it jumps to the PLT slot of printf. The PLT slot is not part of the text section, but it nevertheless contains executable code. The code here loads the virtual address of printf from the GOT and then branches to it. But like I said before, because the addresses are random, um, you don't know where they are at the, at the beginning. So initially, the GOT was populated with the address, all of the entries are populated with the address of the first slot of the PLT, which is a special entry. So the first time we call printf, we go to PLT, we go to GOT, and then we jump straight back to PLT0. And uh, in PLT0, it does some preparation and then calls the dynamic linker, ld.so. The, link, the dynamic linker searches for all available symbols in the virtual address space, finds the virtual address of printf and updates the GOT entry of printf with the true address of printf. And finally, it invokes printf. Now, this happens in the first time we call printf. But the next time we call it, up, the PLT will be able to get the true address of, uh, from the GOT because LDSO has already updated. So in all subsequent invocations of printf, we don't have to go through all this again. We just need to go to PLT and then the correct address is already in GOT. We go straight to printf in uh, your libc. Now, replicating this process is one of the main challenges we're facing in this work. It looks complicated and indeed it is uh, difficult to replicate. So maybe we can simplify this a bit because at the end of the day, the PLT and the GOT is actually a performance optimization because if you have a, if your application uses a ton of external symbols, um, if you try to resolve them, when you load your program, it will take a very, very long time and it slows down your application start time. By doing this lazy binding, you can resolve functions when you actually need them and it doesn't have much effect on subsequent calls. But for us, it is difficult to, to replicate. So um, luckily, if we compile our iFunk library with FNO PLT, the resulting code will only use the global offset table. Now, the dynamic linker, like I said, will have to resolve every symbol in the global offset table at load time. So when you actually call printf, you see that the code here changes. It's straight, it just, uh, branches to the address specified by GOT and then go straight to printf. So this could be expensive at program start if you, again, if your library uses a ton of external symbols, but it should be fine for small libraries, which is the intended usage of um, our iPhone API. Now, if your iPhone library does not call external functions on the target process, or it can afford to use function pointers, then everything already works in our implementation. All you need to do is to specify the pure argument to be true, and then it's self-contained, so we don't need this global offset table. But if you have to make a lot of external function calls, then dynamic linking is a must, is a must, and we are still working on fully replicating this process. In the meantime, 
um, we have a temporary solution, which is trying to borrow the GOT. For this to work, we have to break our assumption a little bit. We assume that the iFunk dynamic library, for example, ld.s, oh, sorry, uh, foo.so, is also available on the file system of the target process. Since the name of the iFunk is shipped with the message, the UCX runtime on the target process can go and search for the dynamic library if the message is not pure. Um, it will try to search for that SO and open it with DL open. And then the system LD.SO will construct the global ensemble for us with all the function pointers that we need. Our compilation toolchain has a Python script that modifies the assembly code of the iFunk library. It replaces all reference to global offset table to an indirection. And this um, indirection here will be modified once the message is delivered and pointed to the reconstructed, sorry, global offset table and all external symbols will be resolved correctly. And uh, again, if you specify during registration that the iPhone is pure, the UCX runtime will skip all these and you have the lowest latency. But you may ask me, um, isn't, this, isn't there a security concern? Like this is literally executing arbitrary code sent by someone else. And yes, indeed it is. Um, but since security is out of the scope of this work, we only have done a um, very basic analysis of the security concerns. The first one is that the InfiniBand standard specifies the use of a 32-bit remote access key to perform writes to pin memory. So when the source process writes the iPhone message to the buffer on the target process, they first need to pass the RDMAR key check. If this check fails, then the package will be re re rejected on the hardware level. Also, the iPhone dynamic libraries are stored on a file system in the folder specified by the environment variable. And that folder is governed, of course, by file system permissions. So the security level of the iPhone, the entire iPhone application is as safe as the rest of your application and your system. And uh, there is also one little caveat about our iPhone um, implementation, which is instruction cache coherency. Um, we discovered this during our test because one of our test machines, L1 instruction cache and L1 data cache are incoherent. Because we are in a code is data situation, this becomes an issue there. Because in the polling loop, it checks the content for, of the buffer until a message arrives. During this time, it is a, uh, sorry, it is treated as data. But then when the message has arrived, it will be treated as code. And then for incoherent caches, the iCache must be cleared before we branch to the execution section. Otherwise, we'll be reading garbage from the cache. Now, flashing the cache is quite expensive. And uh, we have seen non-trivial performance penalty in our benchmarks, especially for small payload sizes. Uh, we will show how much difference it makes in the performance results. So now let's move on to performance evaluation. Uh, we have measured our implementation of the iFunk using point-to-point -point message latency and the throughput benchmarks. And we have also compared it against the UCX acting message to see how we are doing. The first set of tests are performed on a um, Nilverse N1 workstation, a pair of Nilverse N1 workstations. They use Connect X6 uh, HDR InfiniBand network cards that are connected back to back, as you see in the picture, without an IV switch. And uh, all the results we're showing here are going to be internal numbers. The first uh, result is about message latency. So for different message sizes, we do a ping pong benchmark between these two machines. So one active message sent to the other side and then the, the target process, once it receives the active message or iPhone, it immediately returns a, a um, 
message of the same type to the source process back and forth like this. And we divide the latency number by two to get the message latency of active message and iPhone. And as you can see here, for the small messages, the, our iPhone implementation is about 40% slower than the UC active message. The reason here are mainly, the first one is that we have this cache clear operation, which is quite expensive. And it is very apparent in these small messages. The second one is that our iPhone message is shipped with the code and a header, which is a lot bigger than the UCX active message. For example, even in our smallest iPhone message, we send about um, 64 bytes of code and the data. So if you, can, if you really want a kind of fair um, comparison, then the one byte of payload size uh, of for iPhone is kind of corresponding to the 64 byte UCX item message. Now you can see the difference is not that large. So these two are um, the, the cache clear and shipping the code contributes to this different, the 14 percent difference here. And as we increase the message size, the difference gets slow, gets smaller and smaller because the overhead is not dominant. And the cache clear, again, is not a dominant factor. And the crossover point happens around eight kilobyte, or four kilobytes or eight kilobytes of payload data. And after that, the iPhone has better performance than UCX active message, sorry, better latency than the UCX active message. The maximum improvement is about 39, 37%. And uh, if we look at the message rate, again, similarly for small messages, iPhone has much higher overhead than UCX active message. It's about 80% slower. Again, this is because we're clearing the instruction cache and we ship more data than UCX active message. And uh, as, the, the, as the size of the payload the increase, the difference gets smaller and the crossover point for this one happens around one kilobytes. And for certain message size, um, iPhone has performance improvements almost 400% than um, UCX active message. And as we continue to increase, the bandwidth becomes the dominant factor and the difference gets very small. These jumps in the uh, message rate numbers are the result of UCX switching communication protocols. But, uh, Yes, our iPhone implementation is smaller, but it is usually within one order of magnitude. And this was on the machine that has incoherent instruction cache and data cache. And later we have implemented several improvements and the fixes here and there. And we performed the evaluation again on the Okami cluster and Stony Brook University. This time we have coherent L1 cache. So we don't need the expensive cache clearing anymore. Um, the Okami cluster uses Fuji 2 A64FX um, CPU. And um, we have, again, we have ConnectX6 HDR InfiniBand network card. And all the results shown here are going to be internal numbers. So again, let's look at the message latency number. This time, since we have get rid of the cache clear, we can see that for small payload sizes, the UCX active message and the UCX iPhone are very close together. In fact, the difference here is only about 5%. The UCX iPhone is about 5% slower than UCX active message. And as the payload size increases, they are roughly following the same trend. And um, we get, again, at most we get around 37, 30, 8% of improvement over UCX active messages. But the difference is not very significant. And uh, for the message rate benchmark, we can see that, again, for smaller messages, UCX iPhone is, is slower. But this time, it is only about 33% um, slower than UCX active message. And uh, as the crossover point again happens around one kilobyte, and uh, we get a maximum about of about four hundred percent improvement of message rate when compared to active message. 
So um, this result has um, our code is open source on the GitHub. You can check it. It's under the UCX2 chains repository. And uh, we have our paper accepted by the Open Workshop 2021. So here are the conclusions. Um, we have designed an API and an implementation to move computer data to save time and energy. Um, this RDMA-based iPhone API of the two chains framework is our first step to this goal. And uh, in the iPhone API, we can send uh, binary code and data payload to remote process for execution so that you don't need to restart the remote process and um, the new code will be able to execute possibly closer to the data. Also, um, in our evaluation, our performance is comparable to the native UCX message for all payload sizes. But we still need to work on remote dynamic linking and uh, um, to fully so that we can address the issue of using external functions. Now, for future work, the first part again is to implement full remote dynamic linking so that we can get rid of the assumption that the iPhone dynamic library has to be also available on the target processes of our system. Once this is done, the target process really does not have to know anything about the iPhone dynamic library. It just pulls the buffer and everything it needs is already in there. Also, we plan to switch to send receive type of communication so that we don't need the user to manage the buffers. And um, there are some issues when you do this because in some, on some systems, we map a large chunk of pinned memory. UCX will use huge page um, to allocate them. And this has some compatibility issues with setting that buffer to be able to contain executable code. Also, by switching to send and receive communication, all the incoming messages will be able to progress along with other UCX activities, like in UCX active message. All you need to do is call UCX worker progress instead of having our own uh, polling function. And lastly, because we have this Python script that modifies the assembly code of your iPhone library, um, it is not very portable and it's possibly very fragile. Um, we want to support more instruction set architectures. So maybe we will come up with our VM compilation passes to um, do the necessary modifications and so that we don't have to have a separate um, work, uh, sorry, separate script for each ISA. And hopefully it will be more portable. And um, that's it for my communication. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Thank you, Wang Bin. Very nice talk. Yes, I have a question about the comparison to active messages. Uh, did you use the active message rendezvous protocol or eager protocol? Um, for I think for the in the benchmark, I didn't specify whether it's eager or I think I just use the default. So at least for the small payload size, I expected it to be an eager protocol. Right. So I think what happens is that uh, because of compatibility, if you don't specify any special flags, it would use eager protocol for all message sizes, and then it would uh, copy the data into malloc buffer on the receiver side if it has multiple fragments. And uh, this mode would have an obvious disadvantage uh, compared to RDMA. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I, I I don't I don't I don't really remember because I remember check, like trying different configurations, but I didn't see a big big difference on our system. But yeah, I will keep that in mind and try it again. Thanks. Any other questions? Well, I, I have um, questions about the, the future work um, mm -hmm. in, in the context of um, enabling the compilation toolchain in an LBM mm -hmm. and um, library compilation toolchain. And I'm just wondering if 
you have engaged uh, some people in the LLVM community, how they think about this capability. It may be related to some of the talk, um, a little bit next talk, but it would be interesting to, to hear if, if we have any, uh, basically any thoughts. Yeah, um, I'm not an LLVM expert, but in our research group, we do have one. And I asked him, he said that, mm -hmm. Because LVM is very modular, if the everything you need is can be contained in several passes, then essentially you can compile the all everything you need the passes into a dynamic library for LVM. It's basically a plugin, so you don't need to upstream anything to LVM. All you need to uh, have is you have LVM header files and uh, the runtime libraries, so that you can compile your special compilation paths into a few plugins and you just load the plugins when you compile your iPhone library. So it doesn't need any um, like permission or anything from the LVM community. It's all yourself. Thank you. And, and then the, the, the other question I have is um, from the, this is a higher level question, uh, from the application perspective, like for example, um, have you identified uh, interesting applications or use cases that could take advantage of iPhone? Um, or basically, you mentioned instruments, uh, scientific instruments, and, and, and things like that. Uh, but I'm just wondering if you have already thought a little bit more about um, basically a, 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 an application use case uh, um. for. Yeah, like I said, um, this is just an implementation of the, the design of the implementation of the API. And uh, the, since it is part of the two chains framework, it has the mm -hmm. same scope. The two chains framework, as far as I understand, is aiming at using it on the DPUs because right, the DPUs have their own um, processing units, the computational storage devices, etc., and even possibly some kind of edge devices. So maybe Pasha can answer this question better than I do. Uh, you, you covered pretty well the idea is that uh, uh, two chains runtime installed on DPU and you can dynamically program DPU, local or remote DPU, doesn't matter for our framework. Um, this is how we use it today. So I see. in your application dynamically, you can decide what part you want to run on um, CPU, what part you want to run, what function you uh, run on local DPU, remote DPU, and so on. Uh, pretty much any environment where you have application class cores uh, should work. I see. So, so yes, so, so I think there is going to be a synergy uh, between this project and next stock project. I will be interested to, to have a little bit of a discussion because it's the different levels of uh, probably of abstractions that we were seeing here. But yeah, um, now now I see the offloading is, is, is one of the capabilities that you are targeting, uh, one of the use cases. Um, are there any other questions? <laughs> 